what we're going to do now is we're going to continue our discussion about Android and the architecture of Android and its layers. If you recall, last time we discussed the hardware and OS layers. So we talked about, you know, transceivers and sensors and memory and processors just a little bit. We'll cover those a bit more detail, but that's the core upon which everything else rests, literally. And then we have the operating system kernel, and that really is a variant of GNU Linux, which adds support for mobile processing. And what we're going to do now is we're going to keep marching up the stack a bit, and we're going to talk about what I like to call the middleware infrastructure layers. And I'll, I'll explain to you more what middleware is later. You can think of middleware as basically the layers of software that sit on top of the operating system and the hardware, but below the various apps. So we'll talk about that. And we'll see there's a bunch of different sub-layers in the middleware infrastructure layer. The other thing we're going to do, which I think we'll have time for maybe, is we'll also talk a bit about the key components in Android. So Android has obviously a lot of classes, but some of the classes are more important than others, and these are what are called the app components or application components. And we'll see that there are four primary components plus one that kind of glues them all together. We'll talk about those. And then I'll talk a little bit about Java threads. Some of that's a kind of a recap, but I want to give you the context in which it applies in, in Android. So what is the middleware infrastructure for Android? It basically provides these reusable, capab reusable capabilities that go beyond what you're going to get out of the box with the operating system kernel and the networking protocols. So obviously those are important. We couldn't get very far without them. But this set of layers does some other stuff. You'll also see, by the way, that um, we start transitioning from a purely C-centric way to a more C and C++, and even some Java stuff pops up here as well. And we'll see more about that. One of the layers we'll talk about briefly is so the so-called hardware abstraction layer, or the HAL. And as you can see, it sits on top of the operating system kernel, but below the other things. And uh, I'll talk about what its purpose is in great detail later. But for right now, you can think about the hardware abstraction layer as shielding the higher layers of Android from low-level hardware details. Well, you might think, well, that's kind of weird, because that's what an operating system kernel is trying to do, right? The operating system kernel is supposed to handle that kind of stuff. Well, yes and no. So for one thing, the operating system kernel historically doesn't really know, the Linux kernel doesn't really know a heck of a lot about some of the things that Android wants to expose to the higher level services and applications, such as the cellular radio, right? Your typical Linux laptop doesn't really know anything about a cellular radio because your laptop doesn't have a cellular radio most likely. So that's one example of something that's not really going to be um, properly abstracted in the OS kernel. And to the extent that there's even a way to do it, it's going to be through a very low level device driver interface that's unwieldy. And there's other things here too that may be more important for, um, maybe more important for a, a smart device like a, a phone or a tablet than you would with a, a laptop, right? So probably your laptop doesn't spend as much time trying to work on cool camera f features, right? I mean, you may have a camera on your laptop, but it's not used in quite the same way as your phone camera, right? You don't walk around, you know, with your laptop taking pictures of things. That would be a little, little unwieldy. So that's another example. So there's some things that are just not as well supported in a sensible way at the OS kernel level. And so they define a hardware abstraction layer on top of the kernel, which seems backwards, but oh well. I think, however, the real reason that there's this hardware abstraction layer, if you really look at it more carefully, has to do with the licensing model that the operating system kernel of Linux comes with out of the box, which uses something called the GNU public license, or the GPL. And the GNU public license says, if you make any modifications or if you do anything at the kernel level, you must give your source code away. And some people are happy to do that. Some people are not happy to do that. And in fact, a lot of the OEMs, so OEMs would be Original Equipment Manufacturer, which is a strange name, but an OEM would be someone like Samsung or HTC or whatever, people who take the Android source code and then bundle it with their hardware. They don't want to give away their camera, their camera driver. They don't want to give away their cellular radio driver. They don't want to give away all this stuff because that's their intellectual property and they want to cling to it tenaciously. 
So for that reason, they have this hardware abstraction layer, which uses a different licensing model. So people who use the stuff here are not obliged to give away their source code the way they are down here. So that's probably the real deeper non-technical motivation for why there's a hardware abstraction layer. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> ah, good question, because they also changed a bunch of other things, right? So, strictly speaking, they probably didn't need to be separate, right? There was no particular reason why they had to have it be separate. Um, however, and anybody who follows Linux lore knows that Linus is a, you know, sometimes benevolent, sometimes not so benevolent dictator. And pretty much what Linus wants is what Linus gets. And so if you can't convince Linus or his trusted lieutenants at arms, that whatever it is you're trying to do belongs in the kernel, it's never going to get there. And so sometimes, you know, let's take a charitable view. The folks doing Android didn't want to have to be keeping their delivery cycle at the same pace as convincing Linus to do something, even if he could be convinced, right? They, they had their own shipping dates, they had to get it done. So they're like, well, we'll just fork and do whatever we want to. That's, that's the charitable view, right? We'll eventually merge it back. And that's what Linus actually said like five years ago. At this point, it's very unlikely that that'll ever happen because he's trying to bake something that is really optimized for a, maybe a different class of machines like servers or desktops or sometimes laptops as opposed to small footprint stuff. So there's a whole bunch of other things, security enhancements, real-time enhancements that just haven't found their way back in the Linux kernel. And that's because He's trying to optimize for a different design point. And so those things are forever off on branches somewhere that may or may not get for, uh, joined back in. They, they fork and may never join, to use our fork join metaphor. So that's why. There, there's no particular technical reason, except that it just involves you know, persuasion. And sometimes people don't want to wait that long. Um, so that's the, that's the hardware abstraction layer. We're not going to talk a lot about that. I'll give you a little bit more overview of it, because it's kind of interesting. But unless you're Unless you work for like HTC or Samsung or people who sell, you know, third-party hardware to, that plugs into an Android platform, you probably won't do much with the hardware abstraction layer. The next layers in the middleware infrastructure layer or layers is are the runtime and libraries layer, and this has got a, several different middleware elements. Um, the Android runtime is actually very similar to what we've been talking about in this class up to this point. So this consists of several parts. It has this so-called managed execution environment that efficiently runs Java-based apps and other system services. And of course, could also now run Kotlin and other stuff, right? Because it's not just Java these days. It can run other languages besides Java. And there's a couple of different incarnations. There was something called Dalvik Virtual Machine, which was the first generation execution environment for Android. And then as of about three years ago or so, they started moving over to the Android runtime or ART. The primary difference, does anybody know the primary difference between Dalvik and ART? It's a somewhat low-level techie thing, but it's pretty cool. Dalvik, as the name implies, is a virtual machine, which means it interprets things and it has a just-in-time compiler. ART, in contrast, uses ahead-of-time compiling. And so it'll actually compile your Java bytecode to native code before your program starts to run. Whereas with Dalvik, you load Dalvik executable code, DEX code, and then the Dalvik VM interprets that bytecode. It's got a special format. It's not the Java bytecode, but it's similar. So-called register machine code as opposed to a stack-based code, but leave that aside. It would interpret that code at runtime, maybe using a just-in-time compiler to optimize hotspots in the code. So the reason they did that was that, uh, <laughs> quite frankly, iPhone used native compilation from the beginning, so they were faster. Their apps were faster. And so they went to art as a way to get the speed boosted, so they would run comparably. At this point, with faster processors, you probably really don't notice one way or the other. But if you're doing a lot of high-performance computation, a compilational approach is going to be faster for the most part. And then, um, obviously, this is optimized for the constraints of mobile devices. What's the main, what are the main constraints that a mobile device has that your laptop or server probably doesn't? 
so power, <laughs> you typically have a battery. It runs a lot more on battery, and you usually don't have as much memory. Now, you have a lot of memory these days, but you don't have as much as your laptop or your server, probably by an order of magnitude, <clears throat> although it's not as bad as it used to be. And then the other thing we have here is the core, are the core libraries. And these are basically most of the Java class libraries. The Google folks copied the Java class libraries. And then they also have a bunch of Android core libraries, which we won't talk a heck of a lot about in this class. If you take the class in the spring, we'll cover that a bit more. Um, so this part here, you can see anything that's blue is Java. Anything that's green is C or C++. Anything that's red is probably C. Um, and this yellow stuff is typically C also. OK, so that's kind of what that layer looks like. And that's where the threads and all the concurrency stuff lurk that we've been talking about. Bruce. Ah, great question. So the question was, how does Java code call C code or C++ code? So it actually is through this thing called the JNI. Um, and that stands for the Java Native Interface. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the JNI is basically a, a bridge, using that word loosely, that allows you to make Java code calls that will then call into code written in another language, typically C or C++, usually C. And so if you follow the protocol properly, then you can write your implementations in C or C++, and then you can just load them in, and they work ni nicely with Java. In fact, since you asked the question, I'll give you a quick um, rundown on this. Many, many, many of the calls in Android are actually written in C or C++, and they simply have thin Java JNI wrappers around them. And that way, you get the nice features of Java, which is memory managed and you know, type safe and easy to look at and so on, uh, with the runtime performance of C or C++. So it's trying to kind of give you the best of all possible worlds. And it, it works pretty well. Um, let's see. Obviously, the other thing that come here are these components, which we'll talk about in just a second. There are many, many, many more things in the core libraries, right? So there's a database called SQLite. There's all kinds of UI-related stuff that's there. Just everything that you can imagine that's fun and cool to program from a mobile user interface perspective lurks in those core libraries, and there's a lot of them. Naturally, those core libraries, the Android libraries, of which there are a lot, depend fundamentally on the underlying Java stuff, right? They're at, the, at least at the moment, until they rewrite everything in Kotlin, uh, it's very heavily Java-centric. <clears throat> and um, we actually have a whole class on all this stuff, if you're ever curious. It's one of our MOOCs. OK, so as always, there's this balance between productivity and performance. That's why they use Java for productivity with JNI wrappers for performance. And it's a pretty good, pretty good way to do things. Um, and they're implemented as these so-called wrapper facades. Now, the libraries over here, these are all pretty much implemented in C or C++. And if you really poke around here, you'll see a lot of stuff you've probably heard of before. Maybe libc, right? That's the C library interface. That's all written in C, obviously. Uh, WebKit, which is an open source framework for doing web browsers, web browsing, written in C++, developed originally by Apple. Uh, SSL, SQLite. OpenGL, it's a graphics framework. A lot of stuff in here is basically coming from <clears throat> you know, the Apache Foundation or other open source environments. And you rarely access this code directly. Instead, you're going to access it through Java wrappers that lurk up the stack. We'll talk about what's up the stack on Wednesday. Um, overview of key Android app components. Let's see, I'll, I'll cover this really fast. If you want your quiz, I have your quiz. <laughs> uh, I didn't have a chance to go over it. I can give it back to you if you want it now, and we'll go over it on Wednesday. App components are basically what are used to build apps. See that there are four of them, plus something that glues them together. The four things that they have are intents. Intents are basically little messages that can be sent back and forth to indicate either something has happened or that you want something to happen. Right. So it's either a notification of something that already happened or a command to do something. And the intents are sent around by these other components, activities, services, and 
broadcast receivers. Activities are used to provide an interface that the user can interact with. That's me a long time ago with my mullet. Um, very proud of that mullet, by the way. I wish I still had enough hair to have a mullet, but maybe it's not such a bad thing. Um, and uh, that's basically the, the palette in which you can do your interactions with the users, either displaying things or getting input. So if you look at the uh, programming assignments that I keep giving out, if you look at the later versions with the cool user interfaces, under the hood they use activities to do all that stuff. Broadcast receivers are basically event handlers that can be dispatched and notified when something interesting happens. So a good example of this would be you can subscribe to learn when the battery on your phone has gotten too low, which will then notify either your phone app or the system server that, hey, you better plug in. You know, you'll get a little, little pop-up toast or a little icon colored a certain color saying, hey, your battery's running low, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's one of the things you can do with a broadcast receiver. And then the last thing we have here, well, next to the last thing, are services. And services are basically little mini servers that run in the background and often do long-running tasks or tasks that have to access remote resources where you don't want to block the user interface for any length of time. And there's a couple of different types of services. <clears throat> All this stuff will be covered in more detail next semester. And then the last thing is something called a content provider, and that manages access to structured data. So if you have to store things like settings or um, images or uh, profiles or videos or weather reports, whatever you need to store on your phone that'll last beyond the lifetime of a single activity or a single user session, then you want to use the content provider typically in order to be able to get a very stylized way of interacting with persistent storage mechanisms like databases on your phone, files on your phone, things that are cached on the network somewhere like some kind of calendar server or a contact server or email or whatever. So those are the kind of the main things you can do. Bruce. Sure. Oh, yeah. So, good question. So, the question here, uh, I think, is um, especially if you have a slower and you know a slower laptop without ridiculous amounts of memory and processors and so on, you may actually want to run your your app on your phone. Um, yes, you probably could bump it down from 26 to 24, and it would still work. Um, I haven't tried it, so there's undoubtedly something lurking in there that will catch you by surprise. But it's it's certainly worth a shot. It, it should. The Kotlin, Kotlin stuff should run on 24. If, it, if you have problems with that, let me know, because the guy I work with who, who's done all the cool UI stuff, he's a Kotlin uh, evangelist. He loves Kotlin. So if, if it doesn't work out of the box, he'll help us figure out how to make it work. And uh, he's been great to work with, because he, he really loves all this new, cool, gooey stuff. OK, so those are the key components. Like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this class talking about them in great detail. We will cover that stuff in great detail in the, um, the spring semester. All right, this is a good time to take a stop. If you want your quiz, please feel free to come up and get it.